So let's begin. Good evening to uh, the second installment of the Performative Defiance um, lecture series. Uh, my name is uh, Sebastian Orma and I'm um, the research chair professor of, of autonomy at the uh, Center of uh, Center for uh, Applied Research into Arts, Design and Technology. We are very happy today to have um, such a uh, well and long-traveled um, guest speaker, Justin O'Connor, who joins us from um, Australia. He is a professor of cultural economy at the School of uh, Creative Industries at the University of South, of South Australia and visiting professor in the School of Media and Design at uh, Shanghai Jatong University. Before that, um, he was professor at uh, Melbourne, Monash University. And before that, he uh, was at Leeds University. And uh, I met uh, Justin about 20 years ago in uh, Manchester. Justin is originally from uh, Bolton, a smaller town uh, in the uh, neighborhood of uh, Manchester. And um, at the time, Justin was working at Man Manchester Metropolitan University and following really closely the, um, you know, what has become one of the iconic developments, really, of the creative city, which is the, the case of, of Manchester. I think uh, we can say that. So that is, that is what started his uh, sort of career as a uh, researcher, a professor, uh, you know, dealing with um, developments around uh, creative cities, creative industries. And um, so from there, from Leeds, from Manchester to Leeds to, uh, to Melbourne, uh, and uh, from the uh, so very sort of local case of Manchester to basically studying all five, well, four continents of uh, you know, development in the creative industries. I mean, Justin has uh, has really looked at the uh, development of creative cities, creative industries policies all over the world. He has worked for the UNESCO. He has produced a plethora of uh, creative industries policy reports. He has uh, advised cities in Europe, Russia, Korea, and China on creative policies and has worked for all kinds of uh, ministries, uh, including uh, exotic ones such as Mauritius and uh, uh, Samoa, um, ministries of culture. He has written many, many books uh, on uh, the creative industries uh, and papers. He is, I think, one of the international authorities uh, when it comes to a critical assessment of uh, this development, which is, I think, you know, his, um, you know, the great achievement so far, you know, of his. Uh, intellectual career is to have become not, you know, as many of his colleagues, sort of uh, opportunistic uh, 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 sort of enthusiasts about something that has become a really, really problematic uh, development, but someone who has followed this um, development with a sort of honest and, um, and sort of you know, ethical and hence critical uh, um, eye. You know, not closing his eyes for you know for, for, for things that might not really fit the narrative, but really sort of pointing to the holes, to the increasing number of holes that this narrative about the creative industries has, and that has also brought us in a way together. We are using um, Justin's visit to the Netherlands also as a way of starting a book project that looks back at the uh, you know initial ideas of the creative industries and and really sort of looking for you know what went wrong and what can we do to get back to a positive, which was, you know, really a positive uh, and, and quite reasonable image of a, an economy that is led not just by, uh, uh, you know, financial uh, considerations, but also by values that have to do with culture, the arts, and so on and so on. But today, this is only partly the, the theme. Justin has also just finished a book um, together with uh, his wife, Xingu, are called Culture and Modernity uh, in Contemporary China, which is a, a book on the basically creative industries in China, if I may just say it like this. Um, and he's gonna, the talk that he's giving today comes out of this research called Creative Industries in China, from Ketchup to Cold, World, to Cold War 2.0. I want to 
make clear that I'm extremely happy to have you here, Justin, and um, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, uh, Justin O'Connor. Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, I uh, Thanks for the intro. Uh, the, the book isn't called this. I've called it, the, the, the book will be called Red Creative, Culture and Modernity in China. So um, it's a bit longer than that. Um, but it, actually, it's been a very difficult book to write because it's, it's not about creative industries in China. It's moving back and forward between Western notions of creativity and what's and, and modernity and what's happening in China. So it kind of moves back and forward between the two, really. And, and that's kind of what I'll be doing in this paper, uh, focusing on the, the two sides, really. Um, it might be a bit ambitious, but let's see how I go. Um, I mean, to start with the creative industries, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. Um, I'll put the... Uh, I put some visuals up. They're not very good visuals, but anyway, they're just there. Um, so with the creative industries, I'm going to assume some awareness of the debates around creativity. I, I would summarise it by saying that um, the idea of uh, the idea of the creative industry kind of excludes the cultural aspect of these things, uh, these industries. So creativity pushes out the cultural dimension. Um, and so it, it, it marginalises the values associated with culture, which maybe we all know about, and, and turns them into a kind of an economic input. So creativity is a resource to be mobilised, um, mobilised outside of art, and, and put it to work right across the right across the economy. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail, um, but just to say that this has caused lots of problems policy-wise, trying to actually use, the, if you like, the, the input of culture to develop an economic sector. And it's, it's, I spent a lot of time showing how the taxonomy, the definition, the policy things are really problematic once you try and put those together. But I'm not going to um, talk about that too much today. Um, one of the key areas of contestation against the creative industries is this reduction of culture to, to economics, or as, as Angela Matt Robbie would have it, uh, kind of this uh, creation of a social factory, you know, the idea of creative, a creative society being used as an economic generator. So culture as a word of contestation I'll come back to a bit later. But <clears throat> what I want to focus, um, focus on really is this, um, the idea of creativity as being, uh, if, if you like, one of the part of the West's competitive advantage. So this idea of creativity is directly rooted in a Western art tradition. Um, I, I won't prove that in, in any way, but it, creativity is the words that are used, the concepts associated for, uh, around it, are all about the autonomous creativity of the artist in a particular Western kind of way, going back to the Renaissance in some ways. And this is being mobilised as part of the West's competitive advantage. Um, these are UIK examples. And I'll say something more about other countries' involvement. But the way in which creative, creative industries is seen as a competitive advantage, not just because of the... Um, uh, you know, the, the jobs and wealth created, but because the West has a particular uh, monopoly on um, creativity. That's its unique selling point. So in, uh, when, when the UK government launched the idea of creative industries in 98, 1998, the Chancellor of the Exchequer then, Gordon Brown, talked about Britain, the UK, being the new creative workshop of the world. So the idea is that you know, the UK used to be the factory of the world in the 18th century. Now it's going to be the creative factory of the world all over again. Um, and this is it, it, it's quite interesting how this equation between the West, Europe, and over there, in this case, the East, has been constructed. And this is a, a very good book, but ex exemplary book on that, but there are many other writings at the same time. And the, the, the contrast is perhaps well known. The idea is that Asia 
which is a very old European construct, going back to Hegel's lectures in the 1820s. Asia was about um, the state, the heavy despotic state, and social conformity. You know, the, the idea of a Confucian society where everybody is kind of the same, everybody uh, uh, obeys a hierarchical order going right up to the, to the state. The weight of tradition, the weight of authority. And that in the new industri sorry, in the new post-industrial area, it was the soft skills, the soft infrastructure uh, of uh, the, this, these would be the things that count. And so China, because a lot of this is about China, China may be able now to do manufacturing. They may even catch up in technology, but they can't catch up in terms of soft skills soft innovation, soft infrastructure, the kind of human cultural skills, because they are an essentially authoritarian, conformist, state-dominated entity. This is a, this is a claim he, he makes in this. Um, now, this idea of soft skills, uh, soft innovation, that's the way the creative industries uh, kind of uh, discourse puts it. But in fact, this has got deeper roots, which I'll, I'll perhaps point to, because before the creative industries, we had the cultural industries, and they, they're much more ambiguous in their relationship to the economy. Again, it's not something I'm going to delve into, but for them, there was a strong sense of leaving the Ford estate, leaving industrial society, leaving the kind of hierarchical, industrial, re regimented society uh, of, of, it, of the industry and Fordism, and some kind of post-1968 grassroots, popular culture-driven innovation. So the cultural industries idea came out of 1968. It came out of punk rock, you know, the whole kind of do-it-yourself uh, cultural uh, ethos. It comes out of um, it, co it comes out of uh, the, the idea of the creative city, a bottom-up creative city reinventing itself. So there are, there are very positive ideas behind the, the cultural industries that remain there with the creative industries. Um, uh, this idea of a kind of autonomous, bottom-up innovation. Um, and, and one of the things I, I found, and I was talking about this earlier with Seb, that one of the things that I found most disturbing about the, the creative industry is that this kind, of, kind of, this kind of rootedness in a more popular grassroots tradition of, of, of change, cultural change, but also social change, this very quickly became annexed in the late 90s into a kind of California ideology, startups, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, co-working spaces, these kind of things that, that very much dominated the imaginary of the creative industries rather than the cultural industries. But, um, yeah, so here we've got this, the West having this competitive advantage, these new soft skills, autonomous innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was, this was going to help us deal with the fact that now manufacturing, we're talking in the first decade of the 20th cent uh, 21st century, we're, this was going to help us with the fact that manufacturing now had gone to the East. China was now the dominant power in that way. What are we going to do? We're going to design. We're going to create. We have creativity in that way. Um, but it's interesting that actually many of the agencies associated with this, and I think of the British Council, a bit later on actually, the Goethe Institute, they're now doing entrepreneurial hubs, UNESCO itself, and other trade organisations began a process of kind of um, spreading the word of creativity across the globe. And I've kind of been following this as, as working with UNESCO. It's very interesting in the way in which, although we're supposed to keep it to ourselves in the West, the British Council, for instance, all over the world, the benefits of creativity, the benefits of creative industries, mapping document hub, uh, hub, um, hubs and clusters are its big thing at the moment. So there's this sense of spreading the word about creative industries, because in this way, of course, this is about good governance, it's about a new kind of benign economy, and it's part of the kind of, you know, what used to be seen as spreading the idea of democratic and good governance throughout the world, uh, which was part of what the, you know, the mission was, perhaps until the GFC, and certainly up till um, the age of Trump, I suppose. So, um, 
So we've got this idea of a, of a spreading model of, 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 a new form of a new form of economy, which also was a new form of actually social and cultural life linked to the idea of creative industries. And very strongly attached to this was this, uh, what I call the, the creativity bundle. So you see it a lot in things like the British Council, but also the European Union now and UNESCO present these things. And, and very simply, it's the idea of autonomous subjects so it's free individual, a individuals able to innovate in an autonomous, self-directed way, obviously. Working in networks, they're quite fluid networks, they're not in hierarchies now, they're in fluid networks uh, where these things are exchanged. And these networks of autonomous individuals are embedded in local kind of creative milieu. And, and that's those three kind of ideas to kind of sum up the kind of creativity bundle which uh, is presented as a way forward for developing countries but also for other, other countries across the globe to adopt these new forms of working uh, that leads to a creative economy but also to a kind of an emancipated public in these countries, emancipated. Um, and I'll be, I, I won't, I'll, maybe I'll talk about that a bit later. I've been involved in that with UNESCO and in fact one of the reasons I'm here in Europe is to do a kind of a study of UNESCO and the way it uses that creative industries discourse now. But if you like, to cut to the chase, all of these ideas of creativity are about a long-standing trope of European modernity facing a despotic Asia. Um, an Asia weighed down by state and traditions. And it, I see the whole emphasis on creatives and startups as part of this reassertion of this kind of uh, uh, creative autonomy versus the, the state. So, coming to China and this book. Um, um, basically, we've got to when uh, Hutton approaches China from two kind of positions, really, and it, this is quite common in the literature. First of all, one line is, unless it becomes democratic, China will never get any creative industries. So it can, it can have creative clusters, it can try and promote film industries and music industries. But unless it becomes more democratic, it will not ever achieve this because non-democratic countries cannot have real creative industries. We all know that, right? A second line, more subtle, perhaps more opportunist, is that actually promoting the creative industries will make China democratic. So if you start to say the creative industries are the next, the new industrial future, they're the next wave of innovation, uh, if, you, if you say this and China buys into this, as it has done, uh, then it, in order to grow this industry, in order to grow the creative sector, they will have to loosen up, if you like. They will have to allow this autonomous innovation. They will have to allow grassroots small businesses to work in clusters, in creative milieus. Otherwise, it will stall. So these are the kind of two lines. You're not going to get it until you get democratic or getting the creative industries will, by its own logic, lead to kind of more democratic uh, policy. And that, that's another version of the kind of middle class revolution kind of thesis in uh, these things. Um, OK, the reality is very, very different, I think, from what, what's happened in China. Um, I, I would say, for, while I think cities like Shanghai did tend to go for the creative industry model, in fact, using the term creative industries, most of China has actually not gone for this. So China continues to call it cultural industries. And I, I'll say why that's important. Sometimes they say cultural creative industries. But in many ways, it, they're, they're cultural industries. Um, they, th when they do talk about creative industries, it means things like hairdressing or business consulting or things related to IP, but certainly things that are, that are not sensitive, i.e. they're not cultural, they're not about meaning, because, uh, because if it's about meaning, then that's more under the purview of, uh, of the state, of the, of the state government are concerned about this. So creative industries are about kind of non-essential, not very scary stuff, and therefore quite minor. But when we're talking about music, film, games, uh, television, literature, performing arts, these are called the cultural industries. Or sometimes the content industries. 
And this is why, if you look at what's happening in China now, it, initially they did pick up on this creative bundle idea. So as I said, if you, if you ever go to Shanghai, it's full of like, creative clusters. They don't work very well. Uh, in fact, they don't work at all, except as kind of real estate machines. However, a new, it's quite clear now that a new model has emerged in China. And that model is very, is very much uh, uh, linked to uh, Korea, actually. It's very much um, akin to what's happening in Korea, if anybody knows this whole wave of K. And this is, in fact, a cultural industries policy. Now, we all think we've got creative industries policy in Europe, but actually, nobody really has, certainly not the UK who present it. They waft creativity around, you know, bottom up and we work and all these kind of things. But Korea and China, both developmental states, i.e. they're states with a long history of pushing forward the economic development in different ways, they're not the same kind of country. But both of them have a strong developmental state. They have the tools, they have the resources, they have the research to the search capacity to actually identify what do we need to grow the film industry or the pop music industry. How should we do it? How do we implement it? They talk about value chains, access to distribution, um, you know, high capitalization, big financial models. Basically, they have used an industry policy to, and applied it to the creative industries. And in many respects, it's been very successful. Now, they just they call it they call it cultural industries. They call it content industries. Uh, this is by no means a kind of, um, just because they use the word culture, by no means uh, a kind of non, it, it doesn't mean it's not commodified. This is a highly economically orientated kind of process, of course. Um, it's what uh, an author, uh, Hai Kyung Lee, calls post-cultural cultural industries. Uh, it's an industrial process for these things. Nevertheless, it's been very successful. It's been more successful, I think, in Korea, for, for reasons perhaps we can talk about. They have now, they're now by far the biggest kind of cultural powerhouse in, um, in, that, in that region, and obviously with a global uh, impact now. But they've done it by not going through the kind of creative industries, creativity model. They've gone through, as I say, an industrial policy. And this is, this is very much the way in which China has gone in different ways. So, um, lots of the discourse about China has been, uh, it drives me crazy really. Uh, so people go to China, they talk about censorship, media control, right? That's there, right? And we can, I'll come back to that. But the, it ignores what else has gone on in the, certainly since the reform period and certainly since 1992. It ignores the fact that China is engaged in a massive reorganization of its culture and communication system. Um, it's transformed uh, the market relations around which this production is structured, and it, it's, it's done so in a way that bears very little relationship to how that process is deemed to have happened in, um, in, in the Western creative industries imaginary. Um, the market has been used both to modernize, you know, the market is seen as a great modernizing force, um, but also uh, to bring culture under the control of the state. So basically, this, uh, the, the state has played a very central role in this reorganization of the cultural and communication system in a way whose, uh, I think, whose ambitions and its success have yet to be fully registered. Because, of course, in the West, we've got this kind of uh, which is shared, I think, on both left and right of the political spectrum, that you know the state is somehow this negative weight on the cultural sector, um, and that somehow how can a, how can a state have a positive influence on on the production of culture or the system of culture? Um, in fact, this you know this has been very much behind what China has done. So um, now there are huge problems with uh, what China's how China's transform its cultural communication system. There are big problems. You read any of the books, it's a, there's duplication, uh, repetition, overcapacity, and I would say also a lack of, uh, lack of professionalism in the creative content. Um, they've been, as I said earlier, in Shanghai, a lot of the creative clusters have become real estate machines. Um, but it, it seems to me that the, the actual, what, what, what China is trying to do, how it's trying to, how it's trying to seize the whole structure 
of cultural production and culture and communications production uh, bears thinking about from a, a kind of slightly larger perspective than just one of uh, media censorship and, and uh, the stifling of inno innovation. And to order to explain what I mean by that, I'm going to kind of take a step back into geopolitics um, there. And um, China as a, as a state with global ambitions has not just seen this sector as, oh, well, it's got jobs and wealth, um, you know, jobs and income, so let's promote it. It is, an, it's, it is seen as an industry that they want to promote. But, of course, it's also seen as a source of what they call soft power, you know, this famous concept by Joseph Nye. So Korea, too, has really gone for the soft power aspect of K-culture in different ways. So since about 2000 and two, 2006, 2007, uh, they've, they've really gone for this idea of culture needs to be promoted, it brings in wealth, but it's also part of our global diplomacy, soft power, our global presence uh, that they need to, need to promote. And of course, uh, even more recently, uh, four or five years ago, we've got this idea of the One Belt, One Road. Uh, if you know that whole project, it's a massive infrastructural project going right over Asia, basically, going over the top of India, but also going around the maritime routes all the way to Africa and even little bits of Latin America. Uh, you know, so it's, it's lots and lots of cash for infrastructure. But it's also a cultural project, which they haven't quite worked out yet, but it's a cultural project to push back against, explicitly against the idea of Marco Polo, you know, the West to East influence. They're pushing back against that and trying to reorientate the global flows of influence and cultural influence back... Well, they want to balance them. They don't want to take over the world. They claim they want to balance them, but push back against the overwhelming domination of West to East flows of ideas and cultures and things. Very ambitious program, and, and, and it's really, as we all know, it scared Hillary Clinton when she first heard this, and it's continued to scare many of the others. And I want to focus down on one aspect of that, which is the, culture, the, the communications infrastructure aspect of it which, of course, is not often discussed when we get to culture. So let's... Um, I, I want to go back, you know, in terms of the influence of America and, and respect to China. You can, go, you can go back to the beginning of the 20th century when America first becomes this global kind of influencer, where it becomes seen as the, the future, the global, part of the global future. We can go back to the 1970s and 80s, and which is often ignored. We talk about, um, if you read the literature on neoliberalism, you talk about where, ne where neoliberalism first found its first experiments. Where, where was it first tried out? So Naomi Klein is very, is very good on this in her yeah, dis shock capitalism, you know, disaster capitalism. So Chile is seen as a bit, is seen as a first kind of testing ground in New Zealand as well. Uh, and also um, Russia in the 1990s. These are type places where a kind of a neoliberal model was first worked out. But in fact, I'd say that one of the crucial parts of that was in the 70s and 80s, where uh, effectively the United States, with its certainly with the UK, pushed back against what was then called the World Information and Communication, or the New World Information and Communication Order. Now, if you haven't read about this, you should do. It's completely been buried. But at the end of the 1960s, uh, the newly independent countries, you know, the ex-colonies, uh, who were growing in importance in the United Nations, began to push back against the domination of what we now call the Global North. Uh, they were the, the pushback against that domination. And they did it both in terms of economics, you know, the new economic order that they tried to uh, push through, but also in terms of how communication and information flows were structured across the globe. And they failed. They actually were defeated, I think there's no other way of putting it, on all fronts by the USA and its European allies. And the, it kind of stopped the whole kind of global south movement in its tracks. And it coincided at that very time, the late 70s, early 80s, it coincided with the rolling out of a new global infrastructure of communications. So we all, you know, we all talk about the cloud and the weightless economy and digital 
the, it, as we all know, it's based on holes in the ground dug by blokes with diggers and fiber optics and satellites and satellite di dishes and compu computer infrastructure hardware. It's a whole infrastructure that began to be rolled out in, in, the, in the 1980s. And this is what, um, if, you, if you read people who write about communications, people like Dave Hesmer, is very good on this. In the 1980s, there was a whole re-regulation of the world information and communication order. It was re-regulated in terms of pro technical protocols, you know, what could talk to what, on what ground. So this is the fiber optic, the satellites, the computer networks, etc. And of course, it, that became what we now talk about, convergence where the telecoms companies and the broadcasting content companies begin to move together. That began in the 1980s, and it began under the auspices of the USA. And um, at the same time, we get an, a radical onslaught against state broadcasters, so the, you know, the deregulation, as it was called, of state broadcasting in Europe, eight, 1980s, 1990s, where uh, the big state broadcasters were either were abolished or broken up or severely weakened, and international telecoms and, and broadcasters came into the market. This happened at the same time. Now, uh, you know, I, I was there in the I was there in the kind of um, uh, 1990s, and we're we're all, um, you know, we're all about cultural, cul you know, it was the age of cultural studies, wasn't it? Uh, where we were, the, we were all Deleuze and Guattarians, and we're all reinventing ourselves, and we're all bottom up and grassroots and autonomous innovators, and all these kind of things. And a lot of cultural industries and later creative industries came out of that period of the 1990s of, as I say, of grassroots culture. What, what was absolutely missed in this process was how that global communication infrastructure had been reorganized. And by the time, at the end of the 90s, we get the digital startups, the dot-com companies, the all the creative industries writ large, the platforms, and I, I don't mean things like Facebook or um, Google, but the actual infrastructural platforms on which these were based had already been put in place and mostly dominated, not entirely, but mostly dominated by the US with some UA, U, uh, U, um, European kind of input. So, you know, we arrive at the digital economy, which is sold to the global south as the way forward. You know, here's a new weightless economy with human talent, you know, the, the endless resource of human talent. But it can only sit on what was already uh, constructed by um, the US. And what the result we've got is this, as we all know, the massive global domination of, of platform capitalism owned by, owned by US Silicon Valley companies. What's that got to do with China, I hear you ask? Well, what China has done, and it's part of this ambition, see, it recognized that very early on. Uh, I, I remember p talking to people when they first realized that they couldn't get on Facebook in China. It's like outraged. How can, you, how can a country cut itself off from Facebook or Google? You know, it's a, uh, well, of course, now we know that any country with good sense should have already cut itself off from these things. You know, how, uh, Australia, how on earth does a country give over its whole communications infrastructure, one that's you know, expanding into the, the social life of its own citizens, give it all over to a private sector company from you know, the other side of the globe? It's astonishing lapse of judgment. And it's one that China did not make. And, it, and China's modernization program, um, China's kind of attempt to kind of rethink its communication system, ran very early on into the idea we've got to somehow, we can't accept US base or foreign base, if you like, communication systems without some kind of uh, security in that way. So what we've seen is this, take it, this conflict, and it's been underground for some time, but this growing conflict between the infrastructures coming from China and America, and they're part and parcel of this con contestation of, you know, of China's cultural place in the world. So when China's got its industrial strategy for the cultural industries, uh, when it's rolling these out, of course it's looking for economic, you know, it exports. He wants the box, um, the you know, the blockbuster. The uh, he wants all that. He wants. He would like the influence that Korea's got in some ways. Of course, he wants that. But it's also conscious that it's part of its own kind of status 
as a, as a viable nation state. Communication and culture is, for China, a vital national interest, just as it is for the USA. Absolutely just as much. And while, you know, the, perhaps the parties in between have kind of taken their eye off the ball, if you like, the US have been very, very clear about where its interest lies. When the UNESCO 2005 <laughs> convention was signed in Paris, um, it's the convention basically on cultural industries. The, the head of Disney took out a penthouse suite, of course, somewhere in the Ritz in, in Paris. And as soon as she heard that the digital was not going to be mentioned by the convention, she packed her bags up and flew back to America. You know, it, that, that was a t story told to me by somebody involved in that signing process. They knew very well where their interests lay. So, um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is somehow China now sees that communication culture as, a, as part of its vital interest in a, in a kind of Schmittian sense, in the sense of it's part of what we are if we are retained to retain some kind of independence or sovereignty as a, as a viable nation state. And of course, that's something that's deep, really, deeply rooted in Chinese history since the 19th century, of course, you know, the century of humiliation. Um, but this is, I, I want to I try and then this, say this is more than infrastructure. It's more than a question of two superpowers beginning to fight over fiber optics and platforms and things like that. It's also a return to some kind of notion of what culture might be for. What, what is it there for? What, why, why is it valuable? Because, you know, for, for, for many years since the 1990s, a lot of cultural studies has been about, you know, actor network theory. It's been about assemblages and free flows of this and hybrids and, you know, a kind of a, a kind of a global kind of uncontrollable semi uh, con uncontrollable flows that hybridize and evolve under some kind of their own logic, uh, and that culture is, you know, something something that uh, it's an individual choice in some way that that's uh, kind of made up of different identities and different accesses, but in fact that, that, that this culture is grows out of these kind of shifting flows of ideas and symbols, what, um, um, you know, the, the global cultural scape or ideoscape in that way. Uh, but I think what we see now is the end of that, that, that idea that somehow, and, and I think we've, we find it in the growth of right-wing movements, the right-wing movements across the globe have reclaimed kind of culture as a, as a nomis, as Schmitz calls it. Culture is what, he, what we are and who we are not. And they're claiming that in a very strong way, while you know the cultural left are still going on about ANT and assemblages, and it's it's a, it's really um, kind of really quite disturbing. But what what China has done has said no, we claim culture as an essential part of what it is to be a sovereign nation state, and some of that is external, as I say, you know we set who we are versus the USA, but it's also about what it is to be a society. And this is how I want to end, really, because they asked that question in a, in a, in a way that's related to its own forms of justification in Chinese history. We see it as authoritarian, and I think it is to some extent. We can talk about that. But it's asking a question that I think we've forgotten how to answer. Uh, sorry, we've forgotten to ask. We, we might not want China's answers, but we should keep asking those questions. Because if we, and I use that as the... The, ve the broad, progressive centre-left, even. Well, if we don't ask those questions, then, um, then we, 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 we leave that to the, to the right to do. And I, 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 I'm, I'm drawing a long bow here. I, I want to end with uh, somebody who's not from China. This is Brian Eno. And it, it's just a, it's a quote tr coming back to what's at stake with culture. And as I, as I say, I think China, for reasons of where it's come from, both as a, a civilizational state and as a communist party, it cannot abandon the idea of a, of a culture, a national culture. It defines it in a very kind of strict way, but it has not abandoned it. And I think we need to kind of claim the collective aspect of culture again. Certainly not, not in any uniform or homogenous way, but this collective nature. And, and um, Brian Eno talks about, he's very, talks about, well, I won't read it out, but you know, the, 
Why is culture important? Yes, GDP, economics, etc., etc. But that isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is that we've been to all together. Doesn't mean artists alone. It means everyone, all the people, everyone has been generating this huge, fantastic conversation, which we call culture, and which somehow keeps us coherent and keeps us together. And and I, and I really think that the abandonment of any sense of this by the idea of creative industries has done as damage as citizens and as nations and hopefully as some kind of future cosmopolis um, and that somewhere in China they still have an attachment to this idea of culture that we might want to look as slightly more exemplary or certainly look at it as a good question rather than dismissing it as this Asiatic authoritarian monster uh, on the other side of the globe and I'll finish there Yeah. Hey, um, wow. Um, as you say, that was quite a uh, bow, but a, uh, a fascinating one. I mean, I I I yeah, the, so, uh, I mean, if I understand it correctly, what you're saying is that um, by adopting the more or less this sort of kind of Silicon Valley model um, um, of corporate culture, if you, or you know, yeah, that's what it is really, right? It's the Californian ideology. So if European creative industries, you know, um, protagonists, uh, thought leaders, you know, policy makers, more or less through culture under the neoliberal bus, that's what you're, that's what you're saying, right? Uh, and, yeah, what we can, and what we can learn from China and to a sort of more problematic extent, maybe also from from the populist right is um, is not you know <laughs> that what they do you know not not the answer to that 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 they're giving but the, but the question that they're asking to take it you know seriously again is yeah. that is that correct is that yes I okay would tell you, yeah. and 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 do you see so like learning from China almost right um, yeah. uh, you know in a sort of skewed way is that happening anywhere um, I think it's not and it's uh, well certainly not in the west i mean there are there are th there's a, of course intense debates within across asia uh, about this and, and people are there have got very ambiguous views towards china in all sorts of ways but what we we could have had that conversation um but that's been closed down i think certainly uh, in the last two or three years through um through the, the uh, basically a, a kind of espionage war, but it's also an economic war launched by the US. And uh, I think it's a, it's a shift in emphasis. So for the, certainly from, well, from 92 onwards, post Tiananmen, which we come back to, but yeah. um, it, the, the idea has been that China, in a difficult, bumpy way, will eventually have to become a kind of democracy or somebody said like it might be an authoritarian semi-democracy like Singapore some, but it, it will have to come that way because of the rise in middle class because of consumerism and modernity and all those kind of creativity and at some point I would say probably 2012-13 that it shifted and uh, certainly in the in the US and many of the elites in Europe and Australia decided that China was not going to go that way and that its model of economic success represented a threat to their model of economic success. And I think you can see the gradual, how, I don't know how these things work, but through think tanks, through yeah, uh, well-placed kind of thought pieces in, in various different journals, there's been, there was a shift to China is now gone authoritarian, okay. uh, which yeah, it has gone more authoritarian, but it, that, and that Unlike, I don't know, Bolsonaro or Duterte in the Philippines, this is the wrong sort of authoritarian. And it's the wrong sort of authoritarian because it interferes with the free market. Uh -huh. And that's what they are scared of. Could I just draw on that as well, um, Justin? I think two days ago I read that uh, Trump's campaign is now being supported by Zuckerberg. So, of course, that is more reason for us all to drop out of our <laughs> Facebook accounts. 
And that's extremely disturbing in the context of all of this. We talk about authoritarianism as well, but that's also US authoritarianism too, because it also is able to totally mobilize the free market, which is, of course, no longer free. Yeah. And that for us, I think, is something that we really have to put into question. I, I, wanted to, I was thinking also of a very sort of personal story. Sebastian knows my conversation around this. In the early 2000s, I was involved in very much in the creative industry's rhetoric and trying to push it as far as possible. Enjoying uh, setting up an art institution, uh, buying real estate, uh, anti-squatting buildings and being able to buy them, put studios in there, uh, bring in huge economies, um, able to mobilize like million euro accounts and... Uh, one of the biggest problems that I felt within that, so one, of course, it was problematic of then what you call the real estate machine, yeah. machinery, yeah. which is happening everywhere, and that there's a replication of this. Um, and the, then against that, there, there, that there's actually no policy to hold that uh, in any account. So that is one other part of that story. Um, what I find highly problematic is that our board, at board level, were not educated in understanding also entrepreneurialism and allowing many different things to happen that were actually not okay. And this, I think, is also one of the problems we have inside education, that we do, do not talk about the economics of production, that it's some, so, somehow completely removed from, from many of our education programs. Of course, not yours. I mean, you're, you're having that, that within the work that you do. But I think it's something for us to consider very much that we do have that conversation. So yeah. somehow that we are devoid of any sort of uh, eco ec economics and uh, understanding yeah. of that. Yeah, I, think, I mean, it, it, it's difficult and it, it's hard to piece it together. I mean, a lot of the, the first work on cultural industries, you know, kind of academic work done in the late 60s through the 70s was very, uh, they call it political economy. And it was, it was the first proper analysis of what, how these cultural commodities worked, because they are very different. You know, they, they, they don't work in, in the same way as chairs and cars you know, they have a no, their own logic and their own way of organising it. So there's a lot of work on that. And, and it was political economy in the sense that it was, it was about the economics of how they, if, how they made a profit, or what they needed to make a profit, but also it was political in the sense of how that should be part of it, how it could be managed as part of a democr social democratic kind of market state system. So they were very aware of those. And, and, um, and I, I think... I think what, what the, the creative industries, as that emerged in the, through the 90s, pushed any of that critical voice away. And it accused anybody who was critical of creative industries, it was like, oh, you're art for art's sake. And actually, they weren't. They were, they were political economy for political economy's sake or whatever. So what I saw, and I was part of it, so I'll do the mere culpa too, you know, the arts and cultural sector jumped in because he was, the, he was finally, you were talking to economic development people. Absolutely, yeah. And, oh, you know, culture is absolutely central to what, all this. There's some invasion and, um, going on here. And I, and I think that's what it, they, what, what they did. They, they gave, they allowed the economic arguments to be made by economists uh, because that was taking them in the same way. Uh, and, and the worst thing you can do is let the economy be defined by economists. Yeah, and then, we, at yeah. the level of our um, board of trustees, for example, we, um, we were also informed at some point, I'm trying to think which year this is, this is probably by 2012, uh, so we'd already had a 10-year run of being very much in, in this uh, conversation and being pioneers of it as well, because we started at quite an early stage in Amsterdam. We were told that our programs were also too politicized and we should evacuate them of all kinds of content because we needed to get blockbuster exhibitions in. And that for me was shocking. And that is at the point where I thought, this, this, is, not, this is not okay anymore. Yeah. And then of course the people that are sitting in your boards are also only interested in uh, actually mobilizing their own network for their sake and not mm -hmm. for the sake actually of what you talk, we talk about yeah. for culture itself. And this is highly problematic, and that continues. I think often Sebastian is mapping that out too in cities like Amsterdam, where that is a conti continued uh, uh, sort of progression through mm. this. So all criticality is just absolutely excavated. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, th I mean, the politics of board. Somebody just did something, well, last year on uh, uh, just a, uh, an analysis of the boards of all the major arts and galleries and museums in Sydney. 
And, you know, they're people, they're bankers, lawyers, senior media, yeah. kind of faded politicians. And it's incredible. And you go into, you, you know, you go into an arts board at that high level, as you know, and it's, uh, without getting too dramatic, it was neoliberal central. It, there is no question of the market, the, you know, all that. Or the integrity of, of arts production no, as well. No. It's really interesting. I think the, um, I mean, we have to be, I, I, I just wanted to say that I, at least as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think that um, being an entrepreneur is something very important and, um, and, and you know, entrepreneurialism and, uh, and so on. We need that, right? I mean, no question about this. And, and it's also, also in the sense of, uh, I mean, if, you know, in, the Fre in French, entreprendre means to start something anew, right? So in this sense, there, there, there is something very creative in the notion of the entrepreneur. But the funny thing about the creative industries discourse then is that... Um, while there or the is less this, than funny. there is there is this um, well, there, yeah, there is this deep assumption that okay, you know, the arts and to 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 a certain you know degree also the um, designers because of their aesthetic autonomy and so on and so on, they are going to bring innovation into the economy. But the thing is, the way we then sort of translate this into education is that oh yeah, and in order to do that, we first have to streamline them in such a way that the, the entrepreneurialism is exactly, you know, what we believe it has to be. Rather, right, by, by the economists, you know, as you say, rather than sort of thinking about ways of entrepreneurialism or, you know, of being an entrepreneur, of engaging with the creative industries that could actually move something. I mean, luckily, we have, of course, you know, a group of um, former um, students uh, at um, Avance, at, uh, you know, one of the academies that are connected uh, also to our research center and, and, and that we where also your master program is um, located uh, uh, St. Um a, a group called YAF, Young Artists Feed Forward, uh, and they've been together for some almost two years, I think, now, right? Uh, I mean, Rob uh, uh, works with them a little bit, and they are, you know, because what's happening, of course, you know, is that, that you know, so for four years, you know, it, 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 for the time of the bachelor, you know, they, they sort of you know, work on their criteria, right? They, they, they put together some artistic, you know, aesthetic, eth uh, ethical, and so on, political criteria, and then, you know, they go onto the market, and the first thing they have to do is to throw these criteria away. So, so they, are, they are forming this, um, this collective that tries to, you know, help each other to defend the criteria and really sort of engage in, in, in a much more conflictual way um, but but that is an exception right and it, 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 when <coughs> that's not happening that's not happening in, in the big Dutch or English or whatever you know uh, art, art academies either so 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 again you know it's not that we're saying oh you know the economy is bad or anything like that it's just the way it is now is not good enough and we have to change and we have to educate our kids you know our students in a way that they can actually do that and we're not doing this I don't think uh, at the moment well, well I think it's Sorry. I mean, you talked about Manchester. I mean, when I was doing the work that I did in Manchester over the 90s, you know, I, I, it came after the, at the end of, you know, a decade and a half of kind of quite transformative cultural activity in music, in fanzines, popular literature, you know, like um, alternative literature, or, you know, both fictional and, you know, newsprint and magazines. Um, in other in other places, perhaps in Glasgow, at the same time, there's more visual art. You know, you know, fashion, street fashion. There's a whole explosion of creativity, cultural work. None of it was funded by government. You know, uh, I mean, some of it was stolen from universities. You know, <laughs> most of the music industry design was done by using photocopiers and slides from Manchester Metropolitan, you know, or, uh, all the, what's he called, Peter Savile and all those kind of people, all at Manchester Metropolitan Art course, Art uh, College. So, but, but they did it. So in that sense, they were, it was purely entrepreneurial that, you know, you, you had no money and, it, and that still exists now. You go to fringe film networks, it, you know, that people are living on not very much and doing loads and loads. And, and in that sense, you can say, that, well, that's entrepreneurial in a general sense. But actually, that, that term has become so loaded because it, 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 it's used by people who see it in, a, in, a, in this kind of Schumpeterian way. The economists see it as these are the people who will invent the new that will replace the existing, you know, disruption. Uh, and it, and it's, 
it, it's 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 seen in that way. It's highly highly ideological in that way, and and so while of course you you know you can talk about cultural entrepreneurs, in a you know that's fine to a certain level, at, at a certain point, certainly when it becomes policy discourse, it becomes ideological in itself, and they want people you know they don't want people who come up with new solutions to cultural issues, if, it, if I can put it like that, on new stuff. They want people who can set up a business, scale up, and you know, so on and so on. So it, it, it's, um, it, it's the way in which it was colonised, that, that idea of bottom-up innovation, that's perfectly colonised. And we, I, I'd say we all missed it. We all missed because it was like, whoa, we didn't see it. And it it happened so quickly yeah. as well, I think. It was yeah. sort of very exciting in some yeah. moment. So also for us, we were... Um, First of all, we were unfunded as well, and that was actually an amazing time, even though people thought we were sort of really squatty and scruffy. And, but then over 10 years, we grew and then ended up having subsidies, and that's almost when the problem starts. So actually, when you don't have any money, it works better. Mm. And then we created our own economy within that, and we had so much freedom. But the moment then that uh, public money enters the discourse too, then there is some uh, struggle with that. Mm. I'm also curious about this. You mentioned the um, yeah the problematic uh, of not really having creative industry policy as well. Why is that, uh, Justin? Well, because uh, we spend a lot of time with people like you. They talk a lot about it, it having it's meetings and yeah. I mean, I find it incredible, and uh, people. This is the thing that uh, you know people don't really get what I'm saying because you, you go into you look at creative industry agencies that get set up, and it's two people in a filing cabinet, you know, whereas, you, and it's supposed to be the next industrial revolution, you know, down the line, and there's very little resources put into it, whereas the arts sector still has huge amounts of resource, which is fine, you know, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it, it's kind of, it, it's this belief that somehow it's a, we'll do some kind of creativity. So what is it? It's training, a bit of training to be entrepreneurs, uh, microfinance is another one, creative spaces. But after that, well, that would require an industrial strategy. And I mean, certainly, I'm, certainly in the UK, they got rid of industrial strategies in the 80s. So they have no idea on earth what to do. So, and this is repeating now across the globe. I mean, I've just come from Paris with this UNESCO 2005 conference. And these, these are exactly what's sold to them. Uh, Startup spaces, uh, hubs, you know, microfinance, and um, uh, 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 a bit entrepreneurship training gladly provided by the British Council. Uh, Korea has now started actually to say, oh, we'll do a bit of this. And they come in and they, it's, it's really different because they, you know, they come in with, if you, I mean, if you want to treat them as industries, this is how you do it. But it's a, kind of an anathema to that whole kind of creative. So what are they discourse. doing exactly? Korea? Well, they, they, talk, they talk about, if you, I mean, it, I, I'm not, Promoting this is no, no, better. No, of course. They, they say, well, what, let's, if you want product, who's dis where's your distributor? And who's controlling your dis distributor? And you've got to get access to that. You've got to get access to understand your value chain. What's the weak value chain? And they have researchers who can do that. Mm -hmm. you know, if you ask the British Council, you just get, what's his name, Hassan, who will give, give you some stats about something or other, you know, a proper analysis of that, you know. So... Um, but of course, you know they've 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 also got other concerns as well. But but that you know, if you want an industry strategy to do that, uh, Australia the same. They keep saying you know oh, we want a film strategy, but we're not going to give you any money. It will just I mean, it's it's just this incredible double standards. The amount of money, the claims around what creative industries are or will be or could be, uh, and especially in the UK, which you see that oh that you know they're really clinging to this post Brexit. Um, they're putting millions of the, the academic, you, you know this, the academic, um, the AR, AR, what's it, Arts Humanities Research Council have got, taken £200 million and put this into creative industries research. £200 million, that's an incredible amount for academic research, uh, you know. Uh, so they're really serious about it. And it's, what is it? It's VR things. And it's a, there's no industry strategy mm. because they, they can't have an industry okay. strategy. Okay. So it's, it's very odd. Whereas the states, of course, do have an industry strategy, but they don't call it that. But, you know, it's 
it's a military industrial co complex. It's very aggressive trade dealing. It's all the, it's their control over uh, intellectual property flows. Yeah. They, they have a very good industry strategy, but it, it looks like the free market. Well, and criminalizing Huawei, right? Well, yes, and that as well, yeah. yes. Shall we open uh, the discussion for questions from the audience, sir? Uh, maybe I have uh, not so much a question, a question to elaborate on something that you said, which I found very interesting. It was the pushing back to the Marco Polo narrative, like the West uh, implemented the East. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what would be the main narrative or a few of the main narratives that, we, that they push back with? Then they, in this sense, I, I guess I mean uh, both the Cor Korea and China, or yeah. China and China. Well, uh, I mean, it, in part, it's, a, it, it's the uh, China is a civilizational state, and, and what, what they mean by that is that, you know, it, the, a civilization state didn't come into existence just in, a, in the 19th century, or, you know, it's not a Westfa Westphalian state in the sense of a, a, a nation state, you know, with its forms and its sphere of sovereignty, that it represents a distinct ethical, in the, in the biggest sense, ethical, cultural project, really. Uh, and it's rooted in a long-term history of, you know, Confucian history, but other kind of histories. And that, it's, it, that this, is a, this is an ethical pro project that is to be seen as part of what that civilization does. It's not just a state pursuing its own self-interest uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and, and of course, this is what the West has always done. The West its own civilizational state in that way. So China and, and China has become much more confident about that because, of course, you know, if you, the, the, the modernization of chi China at well, from 1890, really, when they lost their first war against Japan. From, from the 1890s, there was this sense of, uh, we can only modernize by becoming Western. Uh, and as you know, this like May the 4th, uh, the May the 4th movement in uh, 1919, it, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy, get, we must absolutely get rid of Chinese culture. We have to get rid of our feudal past in order to become Western, because that way we can fight the West. So it was kind of, it was anti, we, we would say now it's anti-imperialist, but not anti-colonial. We're going to beat the imperialists by becoming like them in some ways, you know. So there's, there's this strong sense of, you know, that China, and especially communist China, is modernizing and we're Western. But increasingly there's this sense of, actually, but we're, we're also different. We also have a different kind of past. But you could say that the West puts their values as uh, universal values. Yeah. Does uh, China also do this? So how, do, how can you compete with the narrative of universal values? Uh, well, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't say they're universal because, uh, well, because it can't, because it's so rooted in China's own trajectory. But also it, it sees itself as part of a multipolar world, you know. So it doesn't want to be a global hegemon, so its values aren't universal. Um, but, uh, but also, it would, it, it, I think it, it would accept, it accepts the, the, uh, a, uh, a civilization, it accepts a space in which civilizers, civilizations can speak to each other, that they have their own legitimate kind of values that can be in discourse with each other, they can exchange. And China would say, we have adopted Western, many Western notions, of course, science and, and uh, that, that, that their idea of democracy, the peop that, which means the rule of the people, you know, that Sun Yat-sen saw himself as a democrat in that way, not liberal democracy. So that they do accept that they've, they've taken some of the universal values from the West, but they refuse to see them in that particular, in the, the, the determined by the form in which the, the West presents them. So they're, they're, I mean, in some ways, they've now become more anti-colonial in that way. They want to provincialize the West, that the West, yes, it's important, yes, it's got its own values, but they're not universal, and we can, we can challenge them, or we can live with them, or accommodate them, but our values and our history is of equal validity, that, that's what they would say. And we should be able to promote that, you know. I mean, that, that's the idealistic view, that there are certainly you know, nation-state self-interest going on with China, of course, oil and resources and, and military influence. But that, that, 
same in the West. So, but, you know, there is that sense of we should have, you know, they say until, quite rightly, until, you know, the 18th century, China was the most civilized state, the most economically, culturally, and politically advanced state in the world, which, which, which it was. Uh, and so, you know, and, and they, they claim a statecraft going back a thousand years and those kind of things. So they rightly said this has not been acknowledged for the last 150 years and it needs to be. I also have another question, if we still have time. Um, we, talk, we were talking about um, creative clusters in Shanghai and how they had become you know, real estate machines. Um, can you explain a little bit what you mean by that? First question, second question. Um, are there examples in Europe where this hasn't happened um, and you know, where cultural clusters have lived up to their ambitions? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's quite easy how it worked. Uh, I mean, first of all, lots of officials from Shanghai came to the UK and parts of uh, the Netherlands, actually, in the early 2000s, looking at, you know, culture brewery. Oh, that's in Berlin, but, you know... Um, uh, yeah, the Western exactly. Gas Fabrique yes, and exactly. those kind of things. And they came to the UK, they came to Manchester. So, and, so part of what they were interested in was this idea of creative clusters. But in fact, they also saw it as ways of using old building stock. So it's very much... So the, the creative clusters in Shanghai are all in older factories yeah. or slaughterhouses sometimes. But the specific mechanism is quite easy, actually. It was a kind of a rent gap. So they, they, they're heavily zoned in China. So these are industrial zones. But, if, but then, so you can't use them for commercial use. Yeah. But of course, creative industries are industries. So therefore, you can charge commercial rates, which they did, but they're actually paying to the city. They're paying industrial things. So basically, what you charge your clients, you can charge them full-on commercial rates, but you yourself as the, uh, are actually paying for that land. You pay taxes or rent from the government uh, for, for an industrial land, so you make lots of money. Okay. So, the ones, so it's kind of simple as that. Okay. And that's why it's different from the European one, okay. which is they're more wrapped up in the, the more general valuation of the um, of property. Yes. But similar processes going on. Uh, you know, the guy, who, the guy who ran the Shanghai Creative Industries Centre uh, also ran a creative cluster. Uh -huh. You know, he invested it with John Hawkins, actually. Okay. Um, and they, they, it was an old slaughterhouse, so they got all these creative companies in, like Gap and, um, <laughs> uh, and Ferrari, the Ferrari Club. But anyway, creative companies. And then they, built, they knocked all the houses down, they put social housing around it and built an artist village. I said, well, I said, oh, uh, can the artists afford this? He went, no, we're not. He said, the artists can't live in the city. <laughs> of course they can't afford it. But it was an artist village, i.e. it was an art village. It had nice things. And so, yeah, so a, it, a platonist art village. Uh, a, in the, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's something refreshing about China is that they say the truth that the, the Europeans kind of hide under lots of other things, but yeah. they actually come, come out and say it, you know. There's another question. Yes. Um, do you think there's, uh, since the autonomy artist is so famous, the uh, ideology in U Europe or West, do you think China has any autonomy artists? And if not, how can they have these autonomy artists? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think the, the function of autonomy in, in Chinese history is, is very different. Uh, I mean, artist intellectuals were that they were, you know, they, they, were, they had a function. <laughs> they served the ethical state. Their job was to, 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 as professionals, as artists or intellectuals, their job was to f define and help refine the, the way in which the state should be ethical. So it, the autonomy is how they, they, you know, their autonomy was not some kind of internal uh, innovation the wild genius in touch with the, you know, the dark forces of history, they, they were much more part of a, a relation, weren't they? They were part of it. Their, their ethical job was to work with the state to, to develop it both aesthetically and intellectually um, as, as part of a social function. And 
that, that's often counterposed to the wild genius artist. But in fact, many intellectuals, I think, in the 19th century, European intellectuals, saw themselves as serving the people or serving the state, you know, San Simonian kind of intellectuals. And, and so it's not as opposed as, oft, as often presented. The, the autonomous artist that is often now promoted in contemporary art is a particular kind of 19th century avant-garde, well, early 20th century avant-garde view of the autonomous artist. Um, whereas, and, and, and I, I found that when that appears in China, as, I, as I've come to see it, it's a very westernized ideology. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, it's and often supported by foreign galleries and, you know, the more autonomous and wild you are, the better money you make when you're selling in New York and those kind of things. But, but I, I think many, we did lots of interviews with artists and writers in Shanghai, and many of them are, are actually torn between the market and the state, and they, many of them wanted to serve the state, which is a thing you don't hear in Europe, but they wanted to serve the state as creators and intellectuals and artists. But the state didn't want them, and the market would only accept it on certain terms. Mm. Uh, some who can, as I say, escape to the global art world, they're the lucky ones, because they can be autonomous and rich. But many of the others were really torn because they, they wanted a purpose, but the state doesn't recognise them that uh, really. And the market is, I mean, the Chinese culture market is, it's a, it's a bloodbath, you know. It, there's, there's, you know, there's no public sector funding, it, it's pure commerce and uh, in that way. So they, 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 the, the kind of, the non-superstar artists in China have a, I think have a tough time not just to survive, but as who they are, what you know, because they they, they find it really difficult to get recognition in in the Bourdieuian sense. You know, the recognition as as doing a good thing, doing the right thing, doing an ethical thing, serving. They're not even dark matter. They're not even dark matter. Well, they're all yeah, you know, they're very yeah, very marginalised kind of in that way. If that answers your question. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. I was processing the thing you said that uh, China thought that only by modernizing they could become more, like, they could only modernize by becoming more Western. Yeah. Um, in your point of view, where are the possibilities or the options um, based within the Chinese culture and maybe based on the soft skills that they have? Um, what are their opportunities? How could they kind of you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, China is a highly relational society, in, in the sense that it's it's um, uh, it, it's it's they they you know. But Chinese people have tended to work in a kind of very fluid structure. It's organised around then that that then there is a kind of hierarchy in that sense. But it's a very fluid structure of of knowing how you fit in and what your function is in, in certain ways. And it's very iterative, it's very, you know, it can evolve in some ways. So when Western business people go in there to China, it's like they want a contract. You do that, you do that, you do that, you deliver it then for that price, if it goes wrong, it's on you. But, and they're going, oh, the, the Chinese have just changed the contract, you know. And it, it, they, they work on a much more relational way w relational patterns and and that's why it's been they they work very good in in a business context you know i mean it's not dna thing but there is a, there are certain patterns of chinese socialization that allow a very entrepreneurial uh, 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 way of way of working that, and they find western kind of contract based business very slow footed and useless and things so there, there is a sense of that relational and cooperative kind of spirit I think that is very strong in China and and I, I'm gonna I'm just gonna mention Tiananmen because you know you know what the, the you know we it's just the anniversary is just gone a few days ago you know what the the dominant Western discourse is that there they were crying out against socialism and for democracy and there was a call for democracy there, but it wasn't a li liberal democracy. I know they had the plas plastic Statue of Liberty, but they, that, that Tiananmen came out of, you know, 50 years, maybe longer, of intense cooperation and debate about what 
the right political way was. Some of it's in cultural revolution form, and some of it's a lot of it has, of course, always been controlled by the Communist Party. But Maoist Communist Party was rooted in the idea of a mass line, you know, of listening to the people and all those kind of things. And th that was there in, in Tiananmen. What they were claiming there was an, a right to speak about the way in which those reforms were going. And Deng chose an authoritarian market. And the, the West, by and large, went along with him. And, I, and I, 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 going back to the last question, I think you know, the potentiality of the Chinese people to, that still have this strong commitment, as, so, as does the state, to the common welfare of the people. Yeah, what, what do they call it? Uh, the, the, can't forget, remember the Chinese word. But basically, the, the, the livelihood of the people. It's a concept that goes back right back to the 5th century AD. Uh, th this is a very strong in China, and it's what limits a lot of neoliberalism in China. And it's, uh, but this idea of, of, a, of a common endeavour and people working within that common endeavour and their right to speak out and discuss how that works, you know, I think that's still the potential of China. And that's, that's to me, the tragedy of Tiananmen. Uh, I mean, apart from the people who died, of course, but the tragedy of Tiananmen is it, it depoliticised a process of transformation that could have been fantastic, I think, you know. Um, so I think it's still there, the possibilities are still there, but not while America is tightening the screws. That, that's just going to make China go more and more, you know. So it's a, it's a gloomy prospect um, in, in that way, but, it's, um, but I still th think the potential is there. In, within China. Does that then just also require, require the Chinese people to have quite a long breath? Because if they want to collaborate in their way, and the people they are going to collaborate with don't understand or don't feel the same way, like how can they use their like skills and... Do you mean outside of China? Yeah. Well, I think we have to start to listen to them. It, it, it's, it's much better understood. You know, you go to Korea and you go to Japan, with, all with difficult, long, difficult histories, or even Mongolia and other parts of Asia. They know. They know what that Chinese kind of... They, they, there's much higher levels of communication and understanding there. Uh, so, you know, in terms of East Asia, well, Asia as a whole, is, I mean, I include Indonesia and Malaysia in this, you know, there, there, there is an awareness of a, a kind of mutual understanding and wariness as well, but mutual kind of communication going on that I think Westerners tend to miss when they try and impose a certain kind of, you know, political and economic structure upon them. So I think it's there in, in Asia, and, that, and it is at the moment a, a dominant force. It's not the dominant force, that remains the USA, but... All right, then um, thank you very much, Justin, for this uh, fascinating talk and, uh, and discussion. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, and also uh, thank you for coming, particularly all the students who are busy at the moment uh, with uh, the preparation of the exams uh, next week. And still they showed up, which is uh, fantastic. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, on a Friday afternoon, I'm very... Yes, exactly. exactly. That's great. Maybe, maybe you know, to uh, end this, um, you know, for those who want to read about, uh, you know, the, some of the things that you talked about today, they can soon they can soon uh, yes. acquire the, uh, the 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 book. That, yes, uh, it's going to be out. It's going to be called Red what? Red Creative. Red Creative. Yeah. yeah. How did you come up with this? Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's my marketing background. Yeah, yeah, yeah Red yeah. Creative. And yeah. it's going to come out with... Uh, Routledge. Routledge. Yeah. At the end of the year? I think so, so yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So Justin O'Connor, Red Creative, at the end of the year. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much again, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay.